Welcome to PC Games Nostalgia, where we talk about yesterday's PC games today. My name is Jimmy Wilhelmsson, and I'm going to be your host for the next 20 minutes or so. And the game we're going to talk about today is... Buenos dias. Everybody here is just as dead as you. That's why we call it the land of the dead. No! Each time we bring a guest from the gaming industry to our digital studio. And today's honored guest star is Ole Landin, Hello. the creator of Quiz Duel was the name of the uh, the quiz app, right? Yeah, we had different names in different locations, but yeah, that's one of them. Mr. Landin, may I call you Ulla? That's fine. Thank you so much. Um, please tell me, that's a fascinating story. You and your brother and two other brothers made a quiz app in Sweden that became so popular that you also took it to several different countries. Could you please tell that story for us? Yeah, so this was when uh, mobile gaming was booming and uh, I was a student back then and uh, me and my brother and, and uh, two other friends, we thought that uh, this is very interesting. It, it looks like it kind of it's kind of like Klondike. So we wanted to <laughs> make a business out of that. Yeah. And uh, we were one of the few <laughs> that actually succeeded. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Was it, was it clear from the beginning that you wanted to do a quiz app, or did you have like a multitude of, of options uh, in your in your head? Yeah, we we had uh, we we did a lot of different uh, games uh, before we made the the uh, quiz game, but we wanted to always to reach a broad audience. That was our goal, right. and uh, a quiz game seemed like a very good fit. And it was. You sold it after a couple of years, and uh, you know it, it went quite well for you. Yeah, it did. I mean, uh, we got over 100 million users while we had the company, uh, and our biggest success was in Germany, where we got over 30 million users, which is quite a lot. In in your native Sweden, it was called Quiz Camp, and and but internationally, it was known as Quiz Duel. Quiz Duel. Okay. Yeah. And it's still around. It's still around. Uh, okay. The company that bought us uh, uh, is responsible for it now, and it's still uh, going pretty well. But that was yesteryear. I mean, what, what do you do today? I've been working with a lot of different interesting uh, projects in the gaming space. Uh, I have a podcast in Swedish where I um, interview uh, Swedish game developers called Spelskaparna. Right. And now, most recently, I've been working together with game developer Martin Magni on the game Fancade. Okay. Uh, which is a mobile game that consists of thousands of small arcade games. Fancade means the fan-made arcade. Got it. Uh, and then it's also a game engine. So all of those games are made with the game on your phone. So it's, it's the only game I know about where you can make games with your phone. And it's out. We actually released it uh, in uh, April of 2020. We'll be sure to check that out. But we're going to talk about something else today. We're going to talk about older games, a game that I know you played when you were about 10 to 12 years old. We're going to talk about a uh, LucasArts game, Grim Fandango. Why is this uh, game nostalgic to you? I think it's... Uh... It's one of those things for me, like personally, it, it was, I got to play it in the perfect age. Like I was maybe 12 or something like that. And it influenced me a lot. Uh, for me, it's like up there with Star Wars uh, because the world of Green Fandango is so, it, it's so good and it's so much in there. Tell us about it. What's the story about? So the story is you, you play the travel, travel agent Manuel Calavera in uh, the strange land of the dead so when uh, someone dies you end up in this world and uh, to get into heaven and to get eternal pe peace you have to uh, travel through the land of the dead and to do this you if you have been living a good life you get to take the uh, train nine which is like really smooth it it, it goes fast but if you have been like uh, not living very well in your in your life, then you maybe need to walk 
the entire distance. And it's pretty hard because it, there are oceans and forests with monsters and that type of stuff. And uh, you play Manuel Calavera, who, when someone dies, you he helps you out with ki which kind of way you get to travel. So if you're a good person, you had a lot of currency, you can buy the train ticket. But if you've been a bad person, you have to walk. And it takes four years, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. If you make it. <laughs> if you make it, right. And yeah. he's, uh, he's struggling because he makes, he makes money out of selling expensive tickets, of course. So he wants to find those people who can afford those fancy Train 9 tickets, if I remember it correctly. Yeah, exactly. So, so he hasn't... Uh, we don't know what he did in his, his life. Right. We never get to know that. But apparently he didn't live so well that he got one of those nice tickets. So he has to work to earn his way right. uh, to heaven. And then there's a villain. His name is Hector. Yeah. He steals people's passes or, or something like that. Yeah, it, it, as you play, you, you, you got to understand that something is strange with the, this corporation that you are working on with, with, the, with the tickets. Uh, there is a lot of corruption going on. And uh, the people who have actually lived very nice lives, they don't get the tickets that they deserve. When you speak about this game, it came out in 98, which is 22 years ago, and you still remember the plot fairly uh, well. I mean, what was it the plot, the story that uh, made an impact on you? Or? It was a really epic story. It uh, plays out through four years. And uh, it's kind of the equivalent of, uh, of the, the epic mafia movies. What they were to movies, I think this was to video games. Hmm. Um, and also it was a very exotic kind of environment. It's, it's heavily inspired by Mexican folklore, yeah. which was very new to me. I had never seen this kind of thing anywhere else. Um, and the characters, that, that's probably the best thing. The, the characters in this world are very well written and uh, very good. I don't know the Mexican or uh, Aztec tradition uh, as well uh, either, but I, I can real I realize that they uh, they look like the skeletons and the skulls that they take out and celebrate with during the Day of the Dead. They they make uh, pop pa paper mache figures exactly uh, those uh, right and and that and the characters have the same visual appearance, and I thought I, I really think that's so clever of them too. Because this was one of the early 3D games, mm -hmm. and most of the games from this era hasn't really aged really well. To, to, to be frank, they look like Right. Uh, because like if you have one texture for an entire face, it doesn't look good. But if you're making something that's supposed to resemble a papier-mâché figure, then you can actually do it really well. And I think that kind of... Um, thinking is really good uh, if you look at movies as well i think uh, terminator 2 was good with that they used for that time they didn't ov overuse the tech they used what can we do well we can make like uh, uh, chrome like uh, material and then they used that many 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 think that grim fandango is one of the probably best adventure games that have ever been made both the story and the 3D uh, engine called Grime that was not... Uh, it, it, there's not much written in it. You don't choose words and combine with other stuff. You, you walk there and you, he looks at things, right? And then you take things out from his jacket instead of having an inventory, if I remember it correctly. So it's really yep. intuitive and still good today. But it did not sell that well. And also, it kind of, according to me at least, marked the end of LucasArts as an adventure game uh, maker. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess, since the game was so good and it still didn't sell, I think that was argument enough for LucasArts not to try to make any additional games. <laughs> well, of course, yes. Uh, but, I mean, the reason... I mean, there is one inbound issue with all adventure games or point and click games and that is when you get stuck it's so annoying and it doesn't really it's not fun at all mm -hmm. so i think as like games were the, were uh, getting increasingly easier or, and more accessible other games 
this genre really struggle with um, there being this kind of um, yeah I mean it, it, it was a bit um, slow in that sense right it wasn't like fun all the time because usually when you play an adventure game you you, you get stuck from time to time of course uh, and I think that was and and also like the people who were uh, like growing up with with this type of games then games in general were also not that accessible they had they had similar issues yeah. so this genre didn't stick out in that sense but at this point in time i think it the, the issue got too big uh, compared to other genres out there and since i guess game fandango took a while to develop they had to charge a uh, full price i mean it was probably a full priced game it cost probably as much as fifa football games or 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 the action games cost which which obviously not that many people wanted to to pay for i guess no for sure i, I mean it was uh, surely uh, a bit old school already back then yeah even though it was an inno innov innovative game, it had the, these things that made it feel a bit old compared to, sure. to other games. You were 12 years old, you said, uh, in 1998. What um, did uh, Grim Fandango in some way inspire you? Yeah, so actually back then I was more into movies mm -hmm. and I, I made, uh, uh, like, uh, th through high school, I made uh, movies with, uh, like, uh, lightsabers and that type of stuff. Okay. Special effects. Okay. Uh, so, so I, I would say that it inspired me more in that career, uh, uh, in a sense. And it was, if we talk about film, like the game is heavily inspired by film noir. Yes. And I think for me, that's kind of strange because for every like new generation, you might not see the old classics, the great art that's come from before. Right. So for me, like, Green Fandango was the gateway into film noir, Casablanca, and the Falconese, uh, the Maltese Falcon, and, and that type of stuff. So you watched those movies after you played Green Fandango? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, really? For me, Green Fandango feels like the original. I know it's not, but yeah. I mean, for me, because I experienced it first. But I can, I can totally get, if you play Grim Fandango, w what inspiration it has gotten from those movies. And I, I can also tell why you like it. Did you finish the game? Yeah, yeah. My, actually, my first encounter, I only played the demo. Okay. But then, because <laughs> it's an interesting story, actually. I, I played the game at my friend's house. And this was at a time when, I mean, my, I, I was in the, when your family got a new computer, it was kind of a cycle of two or three years. And in the beginning of the cycle, your computer was really good. And in the end, it was shitty because you, you couldn't play any new games. Yep. So this was at the point that my friend had a new computer and we had an old one. So it was my only chance to get to play this game. And uh, I actually played it myself because he was the youngest and he had six older sisters. Okay. And we were going to like a party. We were maybe, I don't know, 11 or something. Mm -hmm. So he was still like preparing, going to going into the shower and that type of stuff. His t sisters were preparing his uh, clothes, making his hair, okay. this kind of stuff. And uh, well, while they were doing that, I got to play the demo of Green Fandango <laughs> and, had, and had a blast. So you, so did you end up going to that party at all, or did you just sit? Oh, I'm just wait, wait, wait. I'm just going to play a little more. <laughs> I actually got to finish the game because my friend was <laughs> so slow with with preparing. So. Did you ever look out, because this was in 98, internet was around, even though walkthroughs were not that common, they existed, did you have to use a walkthrough or cheat at any time? I had this philosophy back then, <laughs> okay. that was that you, it's, you cannot cheat, that's not okay. Uh, which, which is not very good with an adventure game like this, because you get stuck. Okay. Uh, so I know I actually... I played like half of it and then got stuck stuck and then it took several months before I picked it up again just because I didn't know how how to do it but then I asked the same friend uh, that um, the party guy I played it at yeah. the first time because he had finished it okay I asked him uh, how how I should move forward and then I it was feet cheating but I 
some kind somehow in my mind I thought it was okay. Do you remember so. where you got stuck? Yeah, it was uh, in the forest. It's this strange puzzle where you you're supposed to move a wheelbarrow okay. in a pattern, and then something happens in the background. Uh, it was a bit strange. Have you ever uh, been wanting to write an adventure game yourself? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually I have made it. Not not the professional one, mm-hmm. but uh, I participated in a game jam just one or two years ago, and okay. we we made a. We made a adventure game. It was a lot of fun. Is it as much fun doing it as it is playing it? Because I, I, I always thought that it's pure game mechanics. I mean, it's fun to make the puzzles, but the rest of the story is, is like, it's game mechanics. I mean, it has to hold together or otherwise the, the whole thing falls apart. I think I would say, at least from my experience uh, during this game, yeah, it's more fun to make it than to play it. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because you, you, I mean, you, you make all of this make up all of these in yokes with the dialogue and right. everything when you make it and you you laugh a lot at it yourselves but then it's I, I don't I'm not sure if it holds up right if you put it out there you're moving your guy like a regular action game uh, in, in in Grand Fandango how how did that work I think it's uh, better because it's fewer options they've constantly made it more simple I, I think uh, game design wise mm-hmm. Like if you look at something like King's Quest or Police Quest, mm-hmm. where you typed in all of the words, then you had almost infinite amount of options all the time. Mm. Then you get the verbs in uh, something like Maniac Mansion, and then it's I don't know maybe nine options or something like that. Yeah. And uh, in this case, you have only two: it's use and look. Uh, and if you look at uh, more recent uh, games that are kind of like uh, adventure games, such as uh, you mentioned Telltale, like Walking Dead, or uh, maybe Heavy Rain. Mm-hmm. Then you usually, in some, sometimes you have multiple ways of getting to the goal, so it's even easier, you know, in a sense. Right. It seems like the tra- trajectory have been to make it simpler and easier. And if you have several ways of doing stuff, uh, I mean, I guess you could have one easy way and one hard way, but I mean. I mean Optimally, you would like to have two ways that are equally hard. I mean, so just to make the replayability of the game, uh, to make it more replayable, I guess. Or, or uh... in a game such as Walking Dead, where they have the story branches out yeah. in different uh, scenarios. I mean, that of course takes a lot of time during development to make sure that the story holds up and in every dialogue that okay, Shit, if the person responds face? like this, does that make sense for all of the different scenarios that have exactly. that could have played out exactly or do we have to sneak a line in between that tells something about what you just did that that sounds yeah exactly they might have to add something yeah, yeah, yeah. depending on what happened it sounds like a horrible uh, way of, of i guess you need to have a, a game mechanic that really supports this so you don't forget anything so that it doesn't end up in, in a mess yeah and i think you you could easily um uh, if you do it wrong you could have like um it's called a combinatorical explosion. Mm-hmm. Is that the word? Yeah. Anyway, it's like you, <laughs> when you combine all, if if you have too many combinations, mm-hmm. it uh, it easily gets out of hand and becomes so many that you can't keep track of them. Right. Uh, similarly to you know a, a chessboard, you can't think many st- steps ahead because it gets the 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 possible combinations gets so many that it's it's. Uh, no one can keep track of it. Okay. Was there anything bad with the game other than uh, than that it probably spelled the end of of the of the adventure game genre? <laughs> Early on, you meet this character called Meche, the woman, which is your your Manuel Calavera. It's his love interest, right, in the game. And I think they keep way too little time to really develop that thing in the beginning. So throughout the game, you, you know that this is his drive. He wants to save her. That's 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 Manuel Calavera's drive throughout the game. But you don't really feel it because for, for you, the player, it's just someone you met really early on mm-hmm. for a really short while. I think they would have, they should have um, made that relationship a bit deeper in the beginning to to have it play out nicer later on in the game. Ah!
I'm getting out of here. This world's for suckers. Ulle, thank you so much for bringing us uh, Grim Fandango uh, back. And <laughs> I think you should go back to Grim Fandango and have, uh, give it another go and see if you still have that nostalgic warmth in your body uh, or if it just feels more outdated than... <laughs> than, <laughs> than it's you. always dangerous to go back to... Uh... I know. To uh, movies and games that you have uh, love, uh, like nostalgic feelings. I know. About, we but, yeah. always talk about that, but we are living dangerously here at PCGN. <laughs> so I suggest you should do that. Ulla, thank you so much, and good luck with everything. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. It was a blast. Talk to you. Bye.